Maurice. Okay. Okay, so I was told I had to talk, so I was like, okay, sure, I always have something to say, but <laughs> and then my dad will go off to me. Um like I said, I have misplaced my glasses, but luckily I write quite big, so that's that's a good thing. Um so just the past couple of let's say like months or so, I've been reading quite a lot about like God and his provision and trusting God, because I think in this like part of my life, I think God wants me to trust him. So, and you know, sometimes when you try to read up about something, you like really pray about something, God keeps giving you the same, the same message or the same verse. And, you know, that fits into God's character. I mean, I always wondered when Jesus was on the earth, these people would ask him all these questions and, can barely think of one time that he really gave a straight answer he usually answered with a question so yeah he does like us to think for ourselves and he does like to hold the relationship because if he just gives you a question you just say okay shop turn around you go away but if you if you ask you another question you have to answer that question and ask another question and ask another question and then it turns into a conversation which turns into a dialogue in a relationship so um, I'm sure you're all familiar with this verse, and I think this is one of my new favorites probably, is Matthew 6, 33 to 34. You all know that verse. It's um, Jesus, he's talking to the people, and he's basically saying to people, don't worry about what's going to happen, what's around you, and how you will be clothed and what you will eat. I think the preceding verses, it's, he says, the body is more important than clothing, and you know, the spirit's more important than the food that you eat. God will provide for you. He provides for the sparrows. He provides for the grass of the field. And then in verse 33, he said, but first seek the kingdom of God and his righteousness, and all these things shall be added to you. Therefore, do not worry about tomorrow, for tomorrow will worry about its own things. Sufficient for the day is its own trouble. So God does say there is going to be some trouble. But he says, take it a day at a time. Don't overthink it. Don't worry. And during this time, I also prayed a lot. And God gave me this verse also in Matthew about where he, his disciples came to him. And Jesus went off in, on his own a lot. And he talked with God. He prayed. And his disciples came to him and they said, like, Lord, can we also pray with God? like teach us how to pray with him i mean they were disciples he was the one who was supposed to teach him all these things and i mean when i heard that i was actually watching that new series the chosen where they have like a, it's like a series about christ on earth and when i saw that episode where they asked god lord teach us to pray like you do and i was like yo like for the first time i really thought like i would also like to be able to pray like jesus did because i mean he got results when he prayed so I think it would be nice to pray like Jesus did. I mean, we also disciples of Jesus. Was it just me? I think like pretty much all disciples of Jesus, we want to follow him and be like him. So logic would say that we would want to pray like him. And then I went and I looked at um, the Lord's Prayer. I'm just going to read it for you. It's in Matthew 6. I think that's a 9 I made there, but I, I cut it. Yeah, it's a 9. Okay. 6 verse 9 to 13. In this manner, therefore, pray, our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. forever. Amen. And I mean, we've all heard that prayer like a thousand times before, but when I look at the average prayer that I've heard in my life, it's not the same structure really, you know? Um, if you look at what Jesus is praying, he starts with our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. He begins the prayer with saying, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done, praising God and just reiterating that his will has to be done, like his kingdom will come, 
he's the things of God is the important things. He's calling out to God and he's focusing on that aspect. He's not saying, hello, God, it's me again. Listen, you're like, I need to pay rent and my marks are looking terrible and I need new friends and da, 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 da. I thank you. Bye. I mean, I, I've played like that a few times. I, like, it does happen. And I mean, as people, we are, we tend to do that, but we, we forget to stop and glorify God also. David wrote and he said, we have to enter his gates with praising and praise and thanksgiving. And here again, Jesus reiterates that. And then here in verse 11, he says, give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. That give us this day our daily bread is, yes, like feed our spirits, but that's the, you know, help me to pay rent, help the children at school, um, help me this day with the tasks of today. That's the, that verse we took and we like made that the entire, the entire prayer. We do that. That's this, this daily bread. We are, yeah, we're like a bunch of hungry course skinners, man. We just want the bread, you know, but we forget the, the kingdom come, the, his will be done. That's the important part. And then he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Yes, we, we come to God and we apologize for what we've done and we are sorry and we, we confess the things before God and we talk to him about like our spiritual life. But he says, forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Once again, like how often have you gone to God and be like, God, help me to forgive this person. And Lord, this other person that has wronged me, help me to remain calm, help me to not be angry, help me to not have a grudge in my heart. That's not something we do often. But God says, if, if forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. Jesus said, the same measure you measure to people, it will be measured back to you. So if you are a man of mercy or a woman of mercy, then you will receive mercy. But if you are, have a harsh judgment, you will receive a harsh judgment. Like the servant that God um, and Jesus spoke about, he came to his master and he said, you had to pay me, I owed him something. And the master said, okay, lock him up, throw him away and put him in jail until he can pay his debts. And he fell on his face before the master and he said, Lord, give me time and I will pay you all. And the master had pity on him. He said, you know what? My heart is... My heart's going out to you. You know what? I'll, I'll forgive your debt. It's fine. Does anybody remember what that guy went up and did like literally immediately? He, he got up. He went to the guy who owed him money. And he was like, listen here. Yeah. And he, the Bible says he grabbed him by the throat. So it's like, give it a whole grape. And he's like, lastly, betal me. Pay me now. The master literally just forgave him. And he went, goes to the guy who owes him money. And he grabs him and he says, pay me all. And this guy also, same thing, like, please give me time. I will pay you all. And he said, no. He threw the guy in jail. He had his wife and kids sold, all that stuff. Immediately after that, he passed the harshest judgment on that guy right after he received mercy. And I'm telling you, the master was not happy when he heard that. He went and he fetched that man. He said, I've forgiven all of this. I've forgiven you all your debt. And you owed me a lot more than he did. He owed you. He owed you a few shilling or whatever. You owed me much more money, and I forgave all your debt. So, you know what? If you want to play this game, we can play this game. And he threw him in the jail, and not only did he throw him in jail, he threw him in jail, and he had him tormented by the tormentors until he paid all of his debt. That's like a whole new level. So, and yeah, that's a scary and gloomy part of the Bible that like, we, as Christians, don't like those parables as much, because it's not so happy, and it's not so running in a grass meadow kind of thing. But, you know, it's very important as well that we know God is not a meek and mild, you know, oh, don't worry, it's okay kind of God. He's a powerful, all-powerful ruler of the universe. Like, do we realize that? Because sometimes I think we forget because our will is only this small. We only see this little bit. But we have to remember that there's all this also that we forget about. So remember, if someone has wronged you and I also struggle with this sometimes. You get so angry. You can ask Misha, like I chat to you a lot and I'm so mad at the professors that did something wrong or one of the people in a group that I'm working with or when I was working at the beginning of this year, someone who did something stupid at work. You get so angry about petty things, really. But God tells us, yeah, this guy has done this thing or this person has wronged you. Yes, but 
you have wronged me and I've forgiven you. So he set the example. So what are you going to do? Are you going to continue, you know, the arm is the phone, being all angry and whatever, like throwing a little hissy fit like a kid? Or are you going to be a proper Christian and say, you know what? God has forgiven me. I will forgive this person. And it's not out of our own strength. God will help us. And when you have to forgive someone like that, it's easier to remember that you are also a sinner and you have been forgiven. If you know that you have been forgiven, it's easier to forgive others because you suddenly you sympathize with them. You know that I was once that person. I was once the one that wronged and I was forgiven. Like I should also do that. So yeah, that's just the important part about that. And then the final verse is verse 13. Do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. The first part of verse 13. If you've, I've recently also read the um, story of Job and everybody knows like the basic outline of the story of Job, but there's like this part near the end where all his friends and everybody comes and they have this seriously like long monologues or whatever with Job that you know just talking with him but it's important to remember that everybody thought that Job had sinned at that point because they all told him that you know what God is a righteous God and he won't he won't let bad things happen to you if you do things right but God never promised us that but those friends tempted him to question God and to question God's judgment and I mean God allowed things to happen to Job, but still God was with him always there. He delivered him from the evil one. The devil, no matter what happened, his flocks that he had, his family, all his possessions, his health was touched, but God never let him fall completely into the enemy's hand. God always had his soul in his hand, and that's what Paul wrote from no height, no depth, no powers, no principalities, nothing in heaven, nothing in the spiritual realm, nothing in the earthly realm, nothing can separate us from the hand of God. And that's the truth. And sometimes it feels like the devil is hitting us, but he's not. He's hitting things around us. God will never let your spirit, sometimes you will become sick. Sometimes you will lose a job. Sometimes you will lose family. You will lose possessions. You will, things will happen, but your soul will never be taken from you. God will keep you in his hand no matter what you will and it's important like when we pray I, the other day i was thinking also when i was talking about or thinking about the prayer part i was thinking like why is it necessary for us to pray because like god knows everything like he already knows what we need like why can we just go to him like god like, just praise him and then let it be done but no that's not how our relationship works you know and I think also, especially if we look at this prayer, do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from the evil one. That's not to remind God that like, if you miss this for a couple of days, he's going to deliver you to the evil one. No, it's not to remind him about that. It's to remind us about that. He does not lead us into temptation. He leads us out of temptation. Like Peter now said about the, um, Psalm 23, where they walk through the valley of the shadow of death. He says, he, he um, guides us, of, yeah, I know this in Afrikaans. Um, so it's in the paths of righteousness for his name's sake. And sometimes those paths, they do go through the valley of the shadow of death because there's no other way. That's how it has to go. But it also says, we're not scared because he is there with us. His rod and his star comforts us. And that's why he leads us out of temptation and he delivers us from the evil one. When the evil one tries to grab hold of us, he, he strikes him down and he chases him away. The devil, if we resist him, he will flee from you. That's what they, I think, was it Paul or was it Jesus? I think it was Paul who wrote that resist the devil and he will flee from you. Not because you are powerful, because, but the, it's not because you are powerful. It's because the one inside of you who's working through you when you resist, the one who is our strength when we are weak, that one, he is powerful, and the devil flees from him. He's not fleeing from you. He's fleeing from the spirit in you. So he does not lead us into temptation. He leads us, he leads us out of it. He always makes a way out. He will never let us be tempted above our means, and he will always also provide a way out. 
So he leads us out of temptation and he delivers us from the evil one. When the devil tries to snare us, he will always deliver us from him. When we call out his name and when we focus on him, and then it just ends off the same. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. And once again, we start with, hallowed be your name, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. And we end off with, we can do all these things and you do all these things for us. For yours is the kingdom and the glory and the power forever. It's Once again, we end off with, a, we praise God. Because when we praise God, everything else starts to fade away and starts to become less scary and less important to you. Because if you focus on Jesus, all the other things will fade away. And yeah, sometimes you will worry, like you will have things in your life that make you, make you scared or whatever. But, you know, that is just a symptom of you need more Jesus. You have to spend time with Jesus. And sometimes, yeah, it's, it's hard and you don't always feel like it and you don't, but the times when you feel down and when you feel just sad and depressed and whatever, it's that time that you have to go to Jesus because then you especially need Jesus. If someone is sick, they don't always want to, if you, if you had small kids, they don't want to drink the pills and the stuff you give to them. All that's true piece. When we were always sick when we were small, my mom had this God oil stuff. Oh, whoa, that was terrible. Like I get like goosebumps when I think about it. It was the worst stuff ever. So when you was, we were sick, we had to drink those things. And yes, that made us nauseous and all that. We hated that stuff. Like I always said, that works because when you give it to a kid, he's too scared to be sick and he just becomes better. But when you are sick like that, you especially don't want to drink those things, but that's when you need it the most. And it's the same. If Sometimes when you feel down, like you really don't feel like spending time or like focusing on God, that's when you need God the most. And that's when you have to spend time with him. So, yeah, just focus on God and make him the center point of your life. Because when you glorify him, all other things fall away. And once again, when we glorify God, it's not to boost his ego or anything. It's because, firstly, he's worthy of it. Because he is. But it's also to remind us that he is worthy of it. If you have a really strong bucky, and you drive with this bucket every day, you forget the power of it. If it's like a proper bucket, because you just drive like 60 kilometers an hour a year round. But every time someone like reminds you, if you chat to your other chummies about your buckies and stuff, and you're like, yes, sir, Rika, right? he's got like 500 and something kilowatts or whatever. And you like, remember that you're like, yes, sir, I actually do have a strong bucky. You remember that. And it's the same with God. Like it's, he's not a bucky, but you know what I'm trying to tell you guys? It's, you know, God, and you get comfortable around and you get used to him. But every now and then, it's good to praise God because if you praise him, you once again realize that, wow, this is, this is not a joke. This is a serious thing. God is actually a lot bigger than I like kind of remember him being because you get used to him and you get comfortable around. That's why we have to praise God. We have to remember that his is the kingdom, his is the power, and his is the glory. It's, that's why we praise him and that's why we glorify him in that's why David wrote a psalm, and for the life of me, I can't remember which psalm it was, where he went to God and he basically fell before God and he was like, God, I look at all the evil around me and all the evil people in the world and they seek my life and they chase me and I just see them prosper, all these wicked people that are just doing so great. And he was like, always, almost had this righteous anger of, this is not right, this is not fair. All these people are around me and they're doing so well and they're all these wicked people. Like, God, you're a righteous God. Why do you allow this? And then he said, but then he drew near to God. And then he started to see who God was. And he praised God. And then, like, the entire tone of the psalm, if you go read it, like, I think my mom knows which one it is. But if you go read the psalm, it's this tone of utter despair in the beginning and anger in the beginning. And it just gradually turns into, Okay, and I remember the Lord, and oh, yes, sir. Okay, so this is who God is. Oh, he's actually amazing. And then you realize that, yes, sir. Okay, everything is actually all right. All is well. God is still good. Because then he sees that the ends of their paths are death, and they will not prosper. God is the one who will have judgment, and he is still in control. Then you realize, it's like he realizes, oh, well, God is still powerful. So, yeah, I just want to encourage you guys, if you go and read Matthew 6, it's a really good chapter. And then 
especially the Lord's Prayer. Go and read it and just look at it with new eyes. And when you pray, remember what God taught us. Praise God. To pray is to praise. And then you ask some things, you know, sprinkled in between. But to pray is to praise. We have to praise Him when we pray. So, yeah. That is all I have to say. So, yeah. Yeah, I think what Tina talked about so important. I'm just gonna I'm not gonna mention all I want to say. Um, but when we started talking, I thought about what a guy told me yesterday. What did Jesus do? How can you explain how he fixed the world? And imagine, I want you to imagine now, you've got an apple. The apple is a world. And when Adam and Eve came, they didn't do what the Lord asked them to do. They listened to the devil. Imagine an arrow, bow and arrow, a guy stood there, and the devil came and he shot the apple and the apple burst open. So the world was broken. What did Jesus do? He rewind all of that. He's basically the one who's taking the bow out of the apple again. And the apples renewed again. That is what he did. So Jesus is a healer. Um, so that was quite interesting for me when I heard it yesterday. But I want what I want to talk to you guys about quickly is um, what are we worth to the Lord? Are we as a human being, are you worth something to him, to Jesus? Um, why do I say, can somebody, can the world take your value away? I want to explain it. I've got a, a dead land here. It's quite a neat one. It's quite new. Nice. But the value of this is what? Ten rand. Who said so? Who made the value of this? The reserve bank. So I'm going to make a ten rand. It is worth ten rand. That's ten rand. Then I've got a twenty rand. It's a little bit more. To see the world worked it a bit. But because this one went through the world, up and down, maybe it landed somewhere in the water, or, or we, we don't know, maybe in dust. What's, it, what's the value of this? And who said so? Who said so? Who said the value is 20 bucks? The maker who made it, the reserve bank. And then I've got ooh, 50 bucks. It went, it went through oh, stone. Just look at this. It's stone. It's, it's not good. It's, it went through a bit. Maybe somebody stepped on it. Maybe somebody bought drugs of it. You'll never know. But now suddenly, because it's looking like this, is it worth 10 bucks now? What's the value of this? 50 bucks. So because the reserve bank said this is a 50, this is a 20, and this is a 10. But all of these notes went through life in different ways. The Reserve Bank is telling us those notes will keep its value because the maker of those notes is who? The Reserve Bank. And they said, that's the value of it. And for us, who's our maker? The Lord Jesus is our maker. And he said, you've got a value because I made you. God is telling us, I made you. You've got a certain value. Let's read out of John. Oopsie, oopsie, oopsie. Let's go to John and we can prove that. Because God said, 
For God so loved the world, John 3 verse 16, for God so loved the world that he gave his one and only son that whoever believes in him shall not perish but have eternal life. For God did not send his son into the world to be condemned, but the world to condemn the world, but to save the world through him. So the Lord said, I'm going to send my son. I'm going to give you a certain value. And nobody's going to take it away. That don't, don't matter what will happen to you in life. Um, if you look at what the, what the word is saying, um, we are definitely going to go through difficult times in the world. The world is not maybe going to push you into a difficult situation. It's definitely going to happen. You will go through difficult times. You will go through difficult times. The world is going to try to take your value away. Don't ever allow the world to take your value in Christ away. Because, because it can't happen. The Lord paid with his precious blood. He paid for our lives. Don't ever let anybody tell you, not a school teacher, not a professor, not, not even your dad or your mom to say you're not worth something. Never. Don't let a stressful situation at work take your value away. Because it can't. The Lord paid with his precious blood for our lives. Make sure you keep your value in Jesus Christ. Keep your value. He's your maker. He's the only one who say what you are worth to him. And he say, you are my son. You are my daughter. I paid with my blood for you. Not with silver and gold. He paid with his blood. And then I want to quickly take you to uh, a guy called Stephen in Acts 7. And I think this guy, Stephen, he knew what was his value in the Lord Jesus. Where they start, um, they sized up Stephen and, and Stephen stood up for the Lord and he said, you crucified the Lord. You crucified. He went through the whole New Testament about and I explained to them what they did wrong. But still, after that, he said to them, listen to what Stephen said to, to them, because he knew his value in Jesus. He said, you stiff-necked people with uncircumcised hearts and ears, you are just like your fathers. You always resist the Holy Spirit. Was there ever a prophet your fathers did not be persecuted? They even killed those who predicted the coming of the righteous one. And now you have betrayed and murdered him. You have received the law that was put into effect through angels, but I have not obeyed it. What did they do there? They get so cross. They got so cross. They said, we're going to stone you. And Stephen said, why do I sit there? And now they're throwing over stones. He said, uh, He said, Lord Jesus, forgive them. They don't know what they do. Please receive my spirit. And I think Stephen is one of those guys who decided, I will not let the world take my value away in Jesus Christ. That is where we should be. We should stand up for Jesus every time, every day, every second of every day. Don't matter where you are. If you're at school, if you're in the university, if you're at work, and the guys, the world is out there to, to die our Christians. Huh? That's it. So that's what it is. They want to take our value away because they know we've got value. Why do everybody, if they want to swear, all the movies, why do they always say Jesus? Because there's power in the name of Jesus. There's value in his name, and that value is given to us through his blood. And Stephen knew that. He knew that. He said, when they throw him with the stones, he said, Lord Jesus, 
please receive my spirit. Then he fell on his knees and he cried out, Lord, do not hold this sin against them. When they had said this, he fell asleep. And you know what Jesus did? The word is telling us, he stood up at the right hand of God and he received Stephen's spirit. That is where we should be. That is where we should be. We should, we should allow the Lord to take full control of your life. We should accept the value that he placed on your life. Don't, don't waste time. Accept, accept his grace. Aanvaar die Heere se genade. Maak het jou eie. Aanvaar die value wat hy vir jou leer heen. Take it in your hands and say, I've got value. The world is not going to take it away from me. Not ever. Nobody's going to take it away from me. I've got value. And my value, my maker said, my value is enough for me to so act the ewige lewe kan behalve. That is what our value is. We are worth enough to live forever. Although the world will take us like, like those notes, some guys will start there and it will go, you will go through difficult times. Difficult times. Through school, through university, people will hit him. I know a guy, one of my dealers, he was an author. And he told me the other day, his father, his stepfather, or his adopted father, he didn't talk to him. Every time he spoke to him, he, he shouted to him. And when he was hiding away as a lighter of four or five years old under the bed, he will come and he will take him by the ear and he will drag him out on his, at, his, at his ear. So this guy, the world tried to took away that guy's value. And that guy, He's a reborn Christian today. He's a wealthy businessman. And in every WhatsApp he will send me, I can see this guy loves the Lord. Because he will say, praise the Lord. Everything, and just the world tried to take his value away. And the Lord said, no, this guy's got value. I also hang on the cross for him. My blood was, I paid for him. And when I looked at Quinton, you must hear that guy talking. His voice is full of the Holy Ghost. Don't matter who's listening. On a WhatsApp group, every hour, MBT is listening to what he's saying. He say, praise the Lord, he's good to me. Every time. So don't ever allow the world to take your value away. Never. We've got value in Jesus Christ. Amen. Dit kan ek het ons afsluit met een gebed ook so maar dan. Ach, ons jemelse vader, dankie. Dankie wie jy is. Dankie dat jy vir ons waarde gegeet. We've got value in Jesus Christ. His blood was paid for us. And the value is Nobody can describe it. Jesus, he is the Seen of God. Johannes 1 says for us, he was in the begin there, is the word. The word was in the begin, and the word was in the begin by God. And he was in the begin by God, Jesus. And he was gehoorzaam on the Father, want he had said, my work is what the world to do for my Father. And he had come to the earth, Het gesterf van die kruis, en die wereldse son is op die skouwers geneem. Nie is God die vader, kon na die kyk aan die kruis te. Want die was vol sonde. En het ons sonde weggevat. En die bloed het betaal vir ons, om die eeuwige lewe te kan beherwe. Jesus, dankie daarvoor. Dankie dat jy vir ons waarde gee. We've got value in Jesus Christ. It will never be taken away by anybody. The devil can't take it away. But the devil is over when he cries. And he knows it. Jesus, thank you. That he for us is worthy. 
En dankie vir die gebed, soos Tidus ook gepraat het vandag. Dankie dat gebed is, dat jy vir ons gebed geloos het, om te sê, dit is wat jylle moet bid. Ons vader wat in die hemel is, wees ons genadig. Geef vir ons ons dagelijkse brood, wie weer. Ons geestelike brood. En dankie, Jesus, dat jy ook vir ons ons fysische brood vir. Dankie dat jy vir ons sorg. Dankie vir die waarde wat jy vir ons gee. Ons is gereed dier Jesus Christus, die Seen van God. Hy het opgestaan en hy het vir ons waarde gegeen. Ons het eeuwigheidswaarde in hom. Jesus, Seen ons so dier die week wat voor, ons verraad het alles om genade. Amen.